Hello and welcome to the episode 186 of What A Fab Day. I am your host, Simon Mas. We have a hot episode today, with live performances, an angry mob, and a problematic songwriting claim. Let's start with the 5th of July 1962 Beatles engagement at the Majestic Ballroom in Birkenhead, the second in a top-rank venue. As explained in episode 179 of this very podcast, this was only one of a long series of similar gigs all over England. One year later, in 1963, the Beatles and their manager, Brian Epstein, had reached the stage in which they didn't have to worry about finding gigs anymore. In fact, Epstein had the opposite problem. He was engulfed with requests. During the day, he finally reached a verbal agreement with an Australian promoter to start planning a Beatles tour down under, to be undertook in June 1964 a direct result of the increased sales and popularity of the band in Australia. We covered that tour, along with other Asian dates, in episode 159 to 181 of What A Fab Day. In the evening, the Beatles appeared on the stage of two different venues, both named Plaza, both owned by a Mary Reagan and her husband. On their first appearance at the plaza in Hansworth, the lads performed the rollover Beethoven, Thank You Girl, Chains, Please Please Me, A Taste of Honey, I Saw Her Standing There, Baby It's You, From Me To You, and Twist and Shout, supported by the Cheetahs and the Red Cups. For the second gig, instead, played at the plaza in Old Hill, the Beatles were backed by Danny and the Diplomats, led by Danny Lane, future member of the Moody Blues and Paul McCartney's Wings. Both performances had been arranged before the Beatles' chart successes, and Epstein had tried to buy back the engagements from Mrs. Reagan, without any success. Let's now move to one of the two main stories of this episode. We're talking about 1966 we're talking about Philippines. In the morning, the Manila Times came out with a bold-faced headline announcing Imelda stood up. The newspapers told the story of the Beatles snubbing an official invitation by the First Lady Imelda Marcos, keeping the first family and 400 guests waiting. As we have seen in episodes 184 and 185 of this podcast, this actually didn't happen. Not in this fashion. But no matter, alternative reality is not a contemporary invention, after all. The first consequence was that promoter Raymond Ramos Jr. refused to pay the band their share of the earnings for the two concerts held the day before. But again, no matter. During the morning, the Beatles and their entourage received a visit at the hotel they had booked, the Hotel Manila. A tax commissioner demanding payment of all the taxes for gross earnings the band made while on the island. Epstein reminded him that, in addition to not getting the money, the contract with Ramos included a standard clause that made Ramos responsible for paying all the local taxes on the Beatles' earnings. It didn't matter. As the Manila Daily Mirror titled, Beatles told, pay now, leave later. The problem was solved with Brian Epstein placing, in the hands of the government official, a bond for 74,450 pesos, about £128,000 in 2020 money. But there was going to be more. When they finally came out of the hotel to reach the airport and leave, the party found out that all the security had vanished like it had happened the evening before. They drove surrounded by an angry crowd. Once at the Manila International Airport, the band and their entourage were repeatedly told that they were passengers like everyone else, and so they were forced to bring their luggage by themselves, including all the gear needed to play, with all the helpers refusing to give a hand 
and the escalators mysteriously shut down. After two flights of stairs, the group had to face 200 more angry Filipinos, pushing and shoving them and actually hurting Rodimal Evans, kicked in the ribs after he fell on the floor, and chauffeur Alf Bickner, fractured rib and spinal injury, as the group reached immigration. Booed by the crowd and afraid to be shot, everyone sprinted on the tarmac into the plane. It was a sad sight. And yet, the plane did not take off. The pilot received instructions for Malevans and Nemesis Tony Barrow to return to the terminal. At this point, everyone feared the worst – incarceration. But there was actually only a bureaucratic problem. Every record of the Beatles' arrival on the island had been lost, and so the band could not leave, since, by law, they were actually illegal immigrants. It took Kevin Sambaro 44 minutes to sort out the matter, during which nobody on the plane actually knew what was happening. Then, at 4.45 pm, the plane was allowed to take off with Evans and Barrow and the necessary paperwork. Minutes after that, President Marcos issued a timely official press statement in which he assured the population that there was no intention on the part of the Beatles to slight the First Lady or the government of the Republic of the Philippines. On the plane, the Beatles were angry about the situation, blaming Turing and Brian Epstein for having risked their and their friends' lives. The situation did not ease when the plane landed in New Delhi, India. What was intended to be a resting stop during which the band could take a breath and deepen their interest in Indian music started with 600 fans greeting them at the airport, clamoring for their attention. Let's instead talk about a recording session held on this date in 1968. Between 5 pm and 1.30 am, the Beatles kept working on Obladi Oblada at the EMI Studios in London. Today, James Gray, Rex Morris and Cyril Rubin recorded sax overdubs on the song, while Jimmy Scott overdubbed congas. Then, an unnamed player recorded a piccolo part on one of the three tracks. The part was almost immediately erased by Paul McCartney, though, who preferred recording another bass line. A rough mix of the song completed the session, so that Paul could bring it home and listen to the work done so far. Paul ended up rejecting this version of the song, making it the first time that a pop band had recruited and paid session musicians only to scrap their work. A curiosity. Jimmy Scott was a Nigerian musician on the London scene, whose catchphrase, Obladi Oblada, was appropriated by Paul McCartney for this song. In November 1968, Scott tried to get part of the writing credits for the use of the phrase. McCartney, naturally, objected, saying that it was just an expression, but Scott, rejected the claim, saying that it was something exclusively used in his family. The matter was settled out of court. In 1969, Scott ended up in jail for failing to pay maintenance to his ex-wife. Upon his request, Paul McCartney accepted to pay his legal bills on condition that Scott dropped any attempt to get co-writer credits for the song. Before wishing you goodbye for today, let me remind you once again to please visit www.simonmas.com support to find out how you can support my work to bring you more and better music-related content. In that page, you'll find quite a lot of things that you can do to make me feel that you care. For the moment, I wish you a good day and a fab continuation. Simon Mas, music you love!